Good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you to everyone who is logging in and joining us. Welcome to the Power of Art Creating Space for Racial Justice. This conversation is part of the What's Next series of roundtables hosted by the College of Liberal Arts at the University of Minnesota. My name is Megan Mell, and I'm the Director of Alumni Experiences and College Events at the College of Liberal Arts. And I'd like to thank all of you for joining us, whether you are watching live or viewing the recording after the event. To begin, I first want to acknowledge that the University of Minnesota Twin Cities is built within the traditional homelands of the Dakota people. It is important to acknowledge the peoples on whose land we live, learn, and work as we seek to improve and strengthen our relations with our tribal nations. We also acknowledge that words are not enough. We must ensure that our institution provides support, resources, and programs that increase access to all aspects of higher education for our American Indian students, staff, faculty, and community members. This afternoon's conversation is part of a series of roundtables addressing the important question of what's next for us to eliminate institutional and systemic racism in society. The series seeks to engage experts from the College of Liberal Arts, as well as throughout our community and beyond. Throughout today's conversation, I encourage you to submit a question for our panelists and moderator to address in the second portion of the event. To do this, you can click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and enter in your question. We also received a number of questions through registration and will incorporate those as well. This event is being recorded and will be shared out with all registered participants and will be available on the What's Next event page. And we'll drop that link in the chat. And you can also view recordings from past roundtables there as well. Our moderator for this afternoon is Dr. Karen Mary Davalos, Department Chair and Professor of Chicano and Latino Studies at the University of Minnesota. She is a leading scholar of Chicana, Chicano, Chicanx art with four books on the subject. Her latest book, Chicana Chicano Art Remix, Art and Errata Since the 60s, exposes and challenges untenable methods in art history. Professor Davalos is currently building Rhizomes of Mexican American Art Since 1848, an online digital tool linking art collections and related documents from libraries, archives, and museums. Professor Davalos, thank you for joining us. I invite you to begin today's conversation. And you just want to unmute yourself really quick. Right. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction, Megan, and for your support in bringing this event to the public. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to serve as moderator for this important discussion with our distinguished panelists. We have Kaylee Bryant Greenwell, a cultural equity and audience engagement strategist with over 10 years of museum and nonprofit experience at the intersections of social justice and racial equity. As head of public programs with the Smithsonian American Art Museum and the Renwick Gallery, she is responsible for leading new outreach and inclusive initiatives towards developing new audiences and cultivating public engagement. Dr. Katie Luber leads the Minneapolis Institute of Art as its Niven and Duncan McMillan Director and President. She previously led the San Antonio Museum of Art where she transformed its relationship to the city through community engagement, the mentoring of new leaders, museum leaders, and a major celebration of San Antonio's Spanish heritage. Maria Elena Ortiz is a curator at Perez Art Museum Miami, where she is spearheading the Caribbean Cultural Institute. Ortiz's culture, curatorial practice is informed by the connections between Latinx Latin American and Black communities in the US and the Caribbean. Currently, she also serves as the chair of the Art and Public Places Committee in the city of Miami Beach. More information about our panelists can be found at the event website, which is posted in the chat. The panelists were asked to consider the questions, how can museums advance racial justice today and over the long term? How do art museum leaders view their roles differently in the aftermath of Mr. Floyd's death? We'll start with this and other questions for the panelists and at approximately 1 p.m. Central Time, we'll take audience questions. Who would like to begin? And mute. <laughs> I'm I'm happy to begin. 
Thank um, you, Katie. Yes. So let me start by saying thank you to Megan, Karen, Mary, and the University of Minnesota for hosting this discussion, which is so critical for our community here in Minnesota and in the Twin Cities, which has been the locus for so much turmoil uh, related to the, the, the murder of George Floyd um, just more than a year ago and for the field nationally. So it's been a long, it's since the pandemic started and all of that happened, it's been a long 15 months. And many of you will, will, not, will not know that I came to Minneapolis just at the beginning of that time. And uh, I just want to say, well, I need no reminders to think about and reflect on the many losses of the last year. I do think it's important to begin with that acknowledgement. It has been a hard year for all of us and the grief and the anger and the loss that we've all felt, but especially our BIPOC communities have felt is just, um, is enormous. So uh, Karen Mary really asked us to think about two questions about how can museums advance racial justice today and over the long term? And how do art museum leaders view their roles differently in the aftermath of Mr. Floyd's death? And the way I'd like to frame that as a starting point for the conversations to come is that this has to be about art itself. I mean, as I frequently remind our staff here at MIA and our community, we're an art museum first and foremost, and that mission needs to inform what we do at all levels. And so to me, that means there are really four essential elements of our work that need to be informed by and seen through the lens of racial justice. And for me, those four are people, collections, interpretations, and access. So each is hard in its own way, but all of them are essential. And it's only by addressing these needs across all four of them together that museums can be truly effective at advancing racial justice. So if you're okay with it, I, I can talk about each one and the way that I see them connecting. Or would you like me to pause there? I mean, I, I think let's, that these let's, are- let's, um, let's allow uh, Kaylee yeah. and Maria Elena to chime in and then we'll circle yes. back. Okay. Um, I can go next. Uh, thank you for this, uh, this great prompt and the opportunity to have this dialogue today. Um, so the question of how do museums advance racial justice, uh, that first part of the question I think is so important. Um, I, I believe in my practice, um, I, I try to um, approach my work um, in, through an anti-racist lens and practice, a critical race theory lens and practice um, every day. And I, I find that currently um, where we see museums attempting to address uh, racial justice, and I appreciate that we're using that term, racial justice, um, is, is through a, uh, an external approach. Um, th there seems to be a belief uh, or a practice in museums that, um, that museums can use their platforms uh, to, uh, to enhance uh, racial justice externally, um, can do uh, community work uh, or, or what have you, but it's a very external based approach. Um, and I, I believe first and foremost that museums need to examine internally that the, uh, the creation of the museum field is, uh, was originally uh, very essentially um, a, a tool uh, to promote uh, white supremacy culture. Uh, we are founded on white supremacist values. Um, white supremacy lives in our structures, in our operations, um, in our collections, uh, and in all of those practices. And so when we think about racial justice and the how to, um, I, I think it's beyond time uh, for museums uh, to start to correct that approach that um, we can't uh, we can't hold um, injustice within ourselves and then start doing racial justice externally. We have to begin uh, with this uh, this internal 
um, alignment, we need to dismantle uh, the, the structures and the oppressive behaviors uh, that currently um, and continue to operate within us. Thank you. Maria Elena? Oh, well, you know, thank you. You know, I'm very happy to be here. So I want to echo uh, what my palace are also um, sharing. You know, um, it's interesting because I don't really see my role differently after the aftermath of the killing of George Floyd. Like, as a Black Latina woman born and raised in the Caribbean, in Spanish speaking Caribbean, Puerto Rico, um, I knew coming into the museum space that I was one voice. <laughs> You know, there weren't that many people like me within the curatorial staff or even like leadership or seniorship or, or all that. So I was very much aware that it was an opportunity to really advance what I think is actually the culture of the majority of the US because especially in Miami, which I think we're gonna get into context later, but in Miami, you know, 60% um, of the population is Latin and then another 20 is black. So I always kind of came into the position thinking I represent the majority and I truly believe that culture is power, especially in a country like the US. So, you know, the exhibitions that I put forward, the um, acquisitions that I put forward, certainly the programs that I put forward very much represents who I am as a person, as an individual. So the aftermath of what happened in the summer hadn't, doesn't change that or didn't change that. What I've seen though, is that there's been a shift in language and the type of conversations that we can have, or we're starting to, some of us are starting to, to, to let themselves feel awkward because they're awkward and uncomfortable conversations. And just to give you an example, I remember when I started working at the museum, I would capitalize the word black, which it might seem like a you know nuance, but in a museum, which as we all know, is a very structured, very academic place, little things like that mean a lot. And after what happened in the summer, the editor stopped on capitalizing my black. And, and also we started capitalizing indigenous. And then the other curators also went along with this whole thing, you know? So those are the, the little things that you can tell that people are a little bit, are becoming more um, cognizant of our racial difference and how they impact this on an everyday level. Um, and, and there's been other type of, of conversations internally at the museum that have happened or that have, have tried to happen now that perhaps last year, the year before might have not um, happened. So I think I would say in terms of language, that's been a big difference. And even just to give another example, we recently, we have a fund of African-American art which we recently changed for the fun of black art, you know, very much, which is, again, it might not feel like a big difference to some people, but it is because it is encompassing blackness as a diverse experience that is not only rooted in, you know, the African-American experience that of course we're in the US and it's very important to, to, to that be an anchor of what we do, but it's also incorporating other people within that narrative. You know, I, I, I want to um, allow Katie to speak more on uh, something she mentioned, because to me, it, it registered something that um, Kaylee said, you know, putting people into this uh, process of your four areas, Katie, you mentioned people. And I wonder if there's a, a connection between what, what you're thinking about at the MIA or MIA, I'm sorry, now that's the new phrase, Mia. Yeah, we, we do call ourselves Mia. Um, and, um, and what Kaylee is talking about internally looking at what people, their roles in social justice, social transformation, racial justice in museums. So Katie? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so by people, uh, I mean the people who are driving the institution forward at the staff and board level. So I, again, I want to remind you all that, that I've only been here at MIA for just a little more than a year and it's been a tumultuous year, but the institution as a whole has been very activated for many years. And over the last five years, MIA has made significant strides in diversifying MIA's board, which you know there was no diversity in 2013 that to what 
in this next fiscal year um, will be about 27%. And, you know, and I know that, you know, Albert Einstein very famously said that not everything that counts can be counted and then not everything that can be counted counts. So diversification on its own is, is not necessarily the marker, but it's a beginning for us. So to me, to be clear, the challenge with, for instance, board diversification is not really in just bringing in more diverse people. We are a diverse community here in the Twin Cities, and uh, these are things that should be possible. It shouldn't be a challenge, but the challenge is one that speaks much more to the structural racism in our society. We don't just need a diverse group of people. We need a steady stream of trustees from diverse backgrounds who see the museum and the mission of the museum as something that they want to support with their time, their wit, their wisdom, as much as their dollars. So I am really pleased with the progress that Mia has made and will continue to make. And we are part of that AAM Ford Foundation Facing Change Initiative uh, about diversifying board leadership. And all of the art museums here in Minneapolis are a part of that cohort, that first cohort. And uh, we, we need to keep working on that. And the other, this other side of the coin, of course, is staff diversity, and then there's audience. Um, and that's staff diversity is another area of, prior, of priority focus for us here at MIA because the work that our people do to bring our collections to life for audiences is essential to that racial justice work. And 20% of our staff identify as BIPOC. And I'm sure that many of you all are aware of Mia's work on equity and diversity issues over the past 10 years. But much of them, that has been as an add-on to people's existing responsibilities, which has made any number of challenges. So I'm really excited that we recently announced that we raised $5 million to endow a leadership position for diversity and inclusion. I, and I think to my knowledge, we're only the second museum in the nation that has been able to do that. Um, you know, so that we'll have an, an endowed position for a senior DEAI officer. And for those of you who don't understand uh, what endowment may be, what that is, it's a secure funding source that ensures that we don't hire a new diversity person and then have to say in three years, oh, our funding ran out and so goodbye, we don't need you anymore. And for me, it was the work of the past year to convince our board that this was really important work and that we had to make sure that we were committed to this in a longitudinal way. Um, and further among our new DNI officers responsibilities will be overseeing our human resources department. Again, that doesn't sound like such an important thing perhaps when I just say it like that, but this, is, this activity supports the growing diversification of our staff moving forward, um, while also improving how we understand, talk about, and advance racial justice issues throughout the whole institution. So that, that is, for me, really just the critical uh, answer to why people are so important, because it is about the leadership of the organization, it's about our staff, and then audience as well, which we can talk about maybe a little bit later. Kaylee, since I used your your comment to pivot to a question, I wonder if you had any thoughts on it as well about internal exploration. Um, yeah, I, I think that uh, I think that there's a, a certain distinction um, that that needs to be made uh, really across the field. Um, I'm I'm really pleased that we're using. Um, we're using the terminology racial justice and that's the the framework that we're having this discussion today but often racial justice is conflated with uh deai with belonging with um, all these kinds of other initiatives uh that are happening in museums that aren't actually rooted in in change making um and certainly not rooted in uh transformation um, when we think about uh, racial justice and what racial justice tells us to do, um, racial justice tells us that harm is, is, is happening, that, that not only harm is happening, that harm is the norm, right? Harm is the default. Um, and uh, all of these other initiatives, you know, belonging, DEAI, 
um, certainly good qualities uh, in those, but uh, to con conflate that with doing racial justice work, I think is really problematic. And I think it's part of the reason why we keep finding ourselves in these cycles of, okay, you know, what's wrong? Why haven't we advanced? Why are we still in the position we're in? Uh, why is it such a struggle uh, to get ahead? Um, because, you know, when we think about, you know, breaking down those letters and we're when we are doing, you know, diversity as a verb, when we are diversifying, when we are uh, we are doing equity, when we are doing inclusion, you know, we're still holding the status quo at the center. We're still holding whiteness at the center. And I think that racial justice tells us that we have to dismantle the existing structures, the existing operations that the default is in fact harm. And that that is the problem. And that is where the work needs to be happening. Maria Elena, I see you shaking your head. Yeah. Um, well, you know, we're talking a lot about like internal processes, right? I mean, in cycles, I do think that like all the cycles that we have had over the past, I don't know, since the 60s, that's also a lot of data, you know what I mean? <laughs> like that's also a lot of information that we know what works, what doesn't work. I mean, I know that we're all very busy, but it would be really a great study to just to somebody to sit down and look at things in a more practical way and seeing why didn't this, you know, why didn't El Museo, what's that story? Or for example, you know, something that we did at PAM, um, there was a museum, I think in Detroit, that they had a uh, fund for, for African-American art that eventually once the fund ran out, the money ran out, so there's no more money to, to buy work. So we started our fund as a fund, and then in 2016, we changed it into an endowment. You know, we started thinking, we, we knew, okay, so this fund possibility is great for five X amount of years since you, when you have the money, but when the money ran out, what do you do? So let's try another strategy. So I think that um, all these cycles are also a wealth of information that we can use to really analyze what helps and, and what can be reshaped. In terms of like internal staffing, you know, to be very honest, when I was hired at PAM, PAM staff looked very different. And um, I, I was hired in that moment where people, where, where the museum was very self-aware that we were starting a new building in 2013 and we really wanted to be the flagship for the city. So we need to look like the city. And um, something that I have seen over the eight years that I've been at PAM is that committing to diversity staffing is a long-term road. Like you're not going to, get there tomorrow, two years from now, three years from now. It's something that you have to commit to for a long period of time. You're gonna have ups and downs and um, and that's okay. It's, it's a process. I, I don't see it as a kind of end result because at the end of the day, you know, and I think that uh, Katie touched upon this, some of our communities may not be at the museum. So it's a, it's a foreign space. I mean, I, I, I'm not gonna go into my bio, but like, you know, the museum was certainly a different access to it was a different place. So, so there's a lot of um, uh, change and education that, that is happening now, thanks to an initiative from the Ford Foundation or Mellon that is going to require uh, time. So um, I just also wanted to kind of point that because I don't think that diversifying institution, it's gonna happen tomorrow. The impulse might end tomorrow, but then how do we commit to it with our boards to really commit to that process of diversifying and, and true social justice? Um, you know, it's interesting the way you talked about uh, what does that history, what does that data tell us? So from my research, multiculturalism of the 80s and 90s, inclusion of the 80s and 90s, what it meant, and this gets to a little bit of what Katie was proposing, it meant there was exhibitions, but no collection. And then even in the 21st century, when the Getty, um, uh, Research Institute, the Getty Foundation in Los Angeles funded two major initiatives, probably three, is to the fair count is three initiatives. We're talking like tens of millions of dollars for 60 in, uh, exhibitions across the Southern California region, right? Even in the 21st century, when they put money towards rethinking 
inclusion, right? It turns to exhibitions, catalogs, but then the gap, collections. It really didn't happen for artists of color, artists of color, women artists, um, queer, transgender artists. Um, and then the question of interpretation. I don't think we'd be having this conversation if those decades of pressure had created transformation in terms of change. I think the first PhD in Chicana, Chicano, Chicanx studies, art history, is in the 21st century. The first PhD in art history. That's a lot of institutional resistance or harm. I wanna to pivot to the question then, um, taking again the lead from, from one of the panelists, Maria Elena said it's not gonna happen overnight. So in terms of advancing racial justice, where do you hope to see your institution or art museums in general in five, 10, 15 years? You can pick whatever time period you, you, know, you, you, you think it would take to get to your vision. Let's go with Katie. We haven't heard from Katie in a bit. Um, um, so I, I am with Maria Elena Ortiz that, that it's gonna take a long time, you know, that our visions of having institutions that reflect the fullness and the richness of our communities, uh, that our collections reflect that richness, that our programming does, that our staffs do, it, it won't because uh, as Kaylee said, our institutions are founded on the, the basis of white supremacy and of whiteness and it will take some time to, over, to overturn those things. And, um, for, and so I, I think it will take a long time. I don't think that it's gonna be quick change. I think that we can start to really uh, make institutional change that will make certain that those changes are built into how we're moving forward. And I, I agree with you so much, Maria Elena, <clears throat> excuse me, that making sure that we're not just spending the money, the dollars of today for the, the concerns of today, but that we, that we are able to build in uh, programs and positions that will be, make it possible for us to proceed, pursue these these opportunities and these goals for a long time. So for instance, we also were just able in this past year to uh, endow a new position for Minneapolis, for the, for the MIA of a Latin American curator. We've never had that. So um, I'm sure that Karen Mary knows much more than I do about this topic as a, as a long-term Minnesotan, but you know, our Hispanic communities in this state are the fastest growing of any uh, minority group. I came from a state that had uh, uh, and a city that had had a Hispanic majority, and it was it was you know very eye opening to me as a white woman to live in San Antonio in that environment and to understand how that that balance of power shift really changed everything about the way that we lived and thought and the way that we approached our work and the way that we uh, found meaning in, in the work of the museum. And San Antonio is a place that has a very, very renowned collection of Latin American art. And uh, most of my leadership team were Latina women and I learned so much from them. So I'm excited to bring to Minnesota my interest in that and my commitment to that. But it's not just that I'm saying to Maria Elena's point that I'm gonna hire this person and I'm gonna make sure it kind of works. I mean, I went out and found the money to make sure that it's a longitudinal change for us because that person, that first person that we hire might stay for three years or 30 years, we don't know. But I wanna make sure that there's a person after that. And I think that that longitudinal piece is critical to the success of racial justice in our institutions. Okay, I can, I can jump in. Um, I'm actually going to answer your question a little bit differently. Um, I think that, uh, that the vision, uh, the vision of the future of museums is, is out there. It's, it's being expressed. We, we, we know what that, 
what that is. We hear about it in conferences. We hear about it in panels like this. Um, so actually, I want to highlight um, some of the, uh, the, the grassroots uh, work that I participate in and, and the, the, the five-year vision there. Um, one such group is um, Mass Action. It's a museum, a site for social action. Um, I've been uh, involved with this group since uh, since its launch in, in, in 2016, and um, uh, this is a this is a grassroots, you know, volunteer-based um, national uh, group of um, of museum practitioners who are are committed um, to uh, to transformation, uh, to transforming the field. And uh, in in that uh, through through a racial justice lens, and you know over over this year, I'm just going to be very frank. Um, since uh, since the pandemic hit, um, witnessing uh, George Floyd's uh, murder and aftermath um, from you know from our home screens, there the the field. Uh, the field has already um, taken such a hit, and and I don't think that it's being discussed enough. Um, the number of positions, the number of jobs lost, the number of um, uh, the number of uh, newly unemployed practitioners, and and who they are. Um, we're talking mostly positions that are front of house, that are in education, that are in community engagement. And if we uh, we look at the demographics of those sectors in our field, that is where our BIPOC peers are. And so this field in the past year has come as overwhelmingly overturned white once again. And that is um, that that is something that should scare us. That is something that should really scare us. That we have gone um, we have gone so far backwards in time in the course of one year and it's not just uh it's not just the layoffs um you know one of the that i hear in, the, in these grassroots uh forums in, in museums and race in empathetic museum uh one of the other things that's even more frightening is the number of bipoc peers that have voluntarily left positions because they they had reached their breaking point of being able to Swallow the harm of their organization. I mean, if we really think about what it means to be BIPOC in a museum space, what that does to our bodies, what that does to our mental state, the, the, the continued harm that we voluntarily place ourselves in, and for, for colleagues to, in a, in, a, in a situation in a pandemic where job security doesn't exist, uh, where layoffs are just exponentially uh, on the rise, uh, to voluntarily leave because the, the, the field just isn't getting it. Um, so my, my, my five-year vision um, is a huge course correction of this. I want to see these grassroots groups, mass action, museums of, and race supported um, by our institutions, embraced by our institutions that these lessons are uh, being taken seriously and being implemented. Um, there, you know, there's uh, within these groups. There's um, there's constant stories of, of you know, retaliation of, of um, you know, people lose their jobs for for just saying uh, this is a white supremacist uh, industry. I mean, I'm I'm lucky to be able to say that and keep my job. Um, you know, I have so many peers that 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 aren't as lucky. And so my my five year view is that. These organizations that um, are really um, holding uh, museums accountable, are creating the resources, are, are pushing the field, are advancing the field, are, are taken more seriously, um, and not just taken more seriously, but, but valued, and, and no longer in a position of, um, of uh, you know, potential harm just for doing the work. Um, not to add more doom and gloom to that perspective, but um, what you mentioned, Kaylee, you know, is all across the board with the pandemic itself. Like, we, pandemic affected communities of color the most, 
So the majority of deaths were in, in our communities. Therefore, um, some demographers were saying that it pushed back um, uh, like the rise of, you know, uh, brown and black people like 10 years back because of COVID. So this is happening all across the board, probably in a lot of other industries. Uh, but the art industry has been particularly hit and people say that there's some positions that are probably never going to come back. That being said, I think, you know, five years is a, is a very, it's almost like a year in museum time. But I think that what I can say right now that I feel like we as a curatorial department have been very committed to is acquisitions. So I'm actually very um, excited to hear what you were saying, Karen Mary, because that's something that we have been really trying to tackle because even though we're in Miami and we do all this great stuff, like our didactics are bilingual, our books are bilingual and so on, um, our collection still looks like the collection like any other museum in the US, where it's mostly white males. And we've been really trying to buy more work and present more work to acquisitions committees and other uh, collecting groups to push other narratives. Sometimes we're successful, other times we aren't, but we keep trying and we really keep uh, pushing forward um, in all of our acquisition avenues, different types of works that we as a curatorial team know that are holes in our collection. So I think that is something that in, fi in a five year span, we can certainly commit to or, or, or could, could help. Um, you know, this question came in earlier. I'm just going to use it as a comment and then pivot to something else. Um, you know, if museums want to mainstream art museums want to invigorate their collections to be more inclusive to represent the population of the nation or the world. Um, the best collections of African American art of Chicana Chicano Chicanx art exist in community institutions or in the case of African American art, they're at H HBCUs, right? So it, it requires a certain kind of collaboration that I think um, Kaylee is suggesting is not very healthy at this moment, right? That if the best work of at least these two populations I'm thinking of exists outside of mainstream art museums, then something else has to happen. Um, let me let me use that maybe something else and, and keep it broad. It's not just collections. The panelists hold very different types of positions in art museums, which are themselves very different in their mission and dramatically different in their local context. And just a reminder for the audience, the Smithsonian American Museum is an encyclopedic and national art museum located in Washington, D.C. The Perez Art Museum Miami is in Florida, dedicated to modern, contemporary, international art of the 20th and 21st centuries. The Minneapolis Institute of Art here in the Twin Cities is an encyclopedic art museum, but with an international focus. Uh, encyclopedic, maybe I should define that for some audience members. That means everything under the sun, as I've written many decades ago. Um, so that could be a, what we call decorative arts in some corners or uh, religious sculpture, or um, I'm trying to think of another uh, example, um, furniture, uh, that's encyclopedic. So the question for my panelists, does place matter in how we reconsider uh, the institution in light of racial justice? Does place matter? For sure. And I would add to, to your list, um, Karen and Mary, also with the time the museum was founded. You know, uh, PAM, it was founded as a Kunstal in the 80s, and it became a museum in the 90s, which means that one of the first work that came into the collection was a work by Lorna Simpson, and this was at the height of identity politics. So from the beginning of the collection formation, which is important because when you think about the board and who are people donating the work to the board, there was this sensibility towards including artists from different types of places. So I would certainly add, you know, time to that context. Um, and because of that, you know, I, I, I can only imagine that we're a little bit more nimble than, than Kaylee's institution and then Katie's institution, like, because we are now building 
new acquisition avenues, new things, you know, so, so there's a, a certain degree of flexibility that we have right now that at times could feel chaotic, but that also is beneficial for having these types of conversations, you know, and like I mentioned earlier, you know, Miami is a majority minority city. So, you know, the population is very diverse, but also because it has a shorter history with like a massive cultural institution, there's a lot of like audience uh, engagement that we have to work on because our audiences are probably more accustomed to go to New York to go to a museum or to go to somewhere else to see art to like Wynwood, like we're here in Miami where the graffiti, than to actually go to the museum because the museum it even feels even more intimidating. You know, it's a new building and a nice area of town. So we have other types of struggles um, uh, that we have to deal with given um, diversity, but also the, our history, our institutional history. Kaylee, the Smithsonian. <laughs> yes, <laughs> the Smithsonian. Um, very fair to say uh, that we are not the most nimble of organizations, but as you can imagine, um, as an institution with uh, 19 museums and centers, uh, you know there, there's there's a lot there's a lot going on there's a lot happening. Um, so certainly, um, you know, in in my work, um, I, I I really take to heart, uh, you know, my background. Um, so uh, I have been in identity-based museums my entire museum career, and I consider Sam. One as well. I think that a museum with the name American in its title is um, talking about identity, um, and so uh, it, it's it's inescapable um, in our work. And and you know this question about place is is important. Um, and and just like uh, Maria said, you know um, uh, the the our place uh, our geographic place within our city I think is uh, is an important conversation. Um, for every museum to be having, and certainly um, where we are at SAM. Um, you know, DC, Washington, DC was a chocolate city until 2013. And I, I am still feeling, I'm born and raised in DC. Uh, so I am still feeling, uh, you know, very sensitive uh, to that loss. Um, uh, I think that um, DC has always sort of been described as a, as a transient city, um, that uh, people sort of come and go um, with with the political cycles, but um, certainly that only describes a, a portion of the city. Um, and then so so to be um, uh, to be born and raised here, and you know in in my adult life uh, for the for the city to transition out of being uh, you know black dominated um, uh, demographic uh, is, is is striking to me. Um, so I think that the, um, the issue of gentrification, when we think about place um, and we think about uh, our, our role in it and our literal uh, structural place uh, within it um, is certainly related uh, to, to racial justice and is certainly related to uh, our role and responsibility in addressing uh, racial justice in that context. And so I think um, I think at Sam, uh, you know, in a, in a in a public programs role, I am predominantly serving local audiences. So you know, DC is is top of mind for me, even though we are a national um, uh, organization and we are uh, we are conveying a, a national message. Um, for me, um, the the, the hyper local um, is very important and definitely drives my work. Thank you. Katie, did you want to comment on the local, the, the specific place or time of the Minneapolis Institute of Art? And you're on mute. Yeah. So I, I, my perspective is a little bit is different than either. Um, I was just listening so much to Kaylee and um, we talked about diversifying collections in place and about thinking about our audiences in place. And, um, but I think that, you know, in terms of place that 
The Center of Arts is an appreciation of emotion and of the human inspiration to create and share those emotions. So yeah, we all respond differently to different things. And I, I don't really see those as being time or geography bound issues. So uh, we just talked about the fact that here at MIA, we will be bringing in a new curator of, of uh, Latino, uh, Latin American art. And uh, I think that, um, that we'll see that we want to make sure that we have a collection here that makes audiences feel like they can see themselves and the works on, on view. And we also want to interpret work so that people from one culture can find beauty and, 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 and inspiration and appreciation in works from other cultures as well as their own. So I, to me, the question of geography is not necessarily so, or a place not so important to the museum as what is inside the museum. Thank you. Um, I want to pivot to a question that might take us in a, in a slightly different um, trajectory uh, so that we're not always just speaking to the choir. Um, while many of us probably in this space are willing to engage a racial reckoning, there are others, including politicians and educators, that want to deny the utility of a framework about structural inequality. Literally, they are discussing critical race theory is irrelevant, not true, uh, some kind of um, um, lie that the left and the, and the educators in higher ed are promoting to young people to indoctrinate them. So the question is, how do you speak or engage with community members at your institution that hold these kinds of views? And it could be in any of the modes that you work in, right? As a leader in an institution, as a curator, community engagement, outreach, any, any way that you want to address that. How do we engage people that don't agree with what we're thinking? Um, I think that there's, there's, there's a few things here because I think that, um, you know, sometimes some of these politics, we have to be careful because they're part of like, like identity politics and culture wars and, and all this other stuff that might not be so practical on our everyday lives. So it, it's, it just riles us up, you know, and not, and not necessarily gives us a strategy to, to, to move forward. Um, I think that is very common. And for anybody that's in this webinar that is interested in going to museum work, you will find people that don't agree with you in a lot politically, economically, in a lot of different ways. And I think that going into the field is also understanding that and knowing that our, at least the way I approach it on myself, my job is to keep going at the stuff that I believe in and the, and the, and the, the themes and ethics that I believe in and just understand in a very objective matter that somebody disagrees with me, but that doesn't mean that I need to change my point of view or stop doing what I'm doing or stop trying to communicate. So I think that just, and it sounds very simple, but the, the act of just trying to communicate in a respectful manner and in a way that the communication is flowing for me is the best thing that you can do because you will find people that disagree with you. And I do think that at the end of the day, um, regardless of the position as a society, our role is to keep growing and to keep being in conversation, not to turn into this place of complete chaos and destruction and, you know, complete, a, you know, like disarray. So I think that there's a moment that we have to accept a different, that somebody thinks somebody different, as long as that position is not directly harming me or, you know, which that's, that's when you know that it has gotten into a horrible negative place. I, I love what Maria Elena was saying about the idea that we are thinking about continuing to have conversations about the way that we address these things and that we have to recognize that there are a variety of different opinions that surround us and that we can be, and for me as the director of a museum, I have to be cognizant that there are many different kinds of opinions, both 
amongst my large staff and then amongst the board and in the community. And I think that to, for us to all be able to find the pathway forward that we can take together is how we can also ensure the long lastingness of our commitment to this work. Haley, did you have any thoughts? Um, just to echo that, um, that I think, yes, we have to, we have to hold the line. Um, we have to keep the commitment um, to doing the work. Um, uh, I, I want as much as possible in my work not to, um, not to mirror white supremacy culture in, in my own approach. Um, but sometimes I do find myself, you know, uh, pointing to the facts, pointing to the data, pointing to, you know, the, the, the headlines, because, um, uh, because having that backing does um, help to make the point of, um, you, know, uh, you know, pick a headline, any headline, um, they're, they're, uh, the, the facts are out there, um, the audience responses are out there. Um, audiences are, are, are fed up um, with excuses from museums. They're fed up with the slowness of museums. Uh, they're, they're fed up with the, these inadequacies. And so um, I think this helps uh, to, to keep us on track, uh, pointing back to, um, you know, our, our mission is to, is, is to serve the people and the people have spoken. Um, I, I wanna, drive that question a little bit further based on something that Kaylee said um, on doing white supremacy culture in a museum, particularly, you know, thinking about the, one of the questions that's come in. Um, I had to confront this for myself. Let me just put it in, in that context. I work in a predominantly white institution. And you can pretty much say that about any higher ed institution. There's a few Hispanic serving institutions, historically black colleges and universities, um, but most institutions are predominantly white, even if the student body is diverse racially, culturally, et cetera, because the concepts are driven by the Eurocentric Western notions of what is knowledge. So how do we bring uh, new voices, new people into those spaces that can be harmful and toxic? What are we doing personally to undo white supremacy as a culture in art spaces and the spaces that we work? I'm gonna start with Katie. Okay, um, am I on mute still? So the way we can bring more people of diverse backgrounds and, um, and points of view into our spaces is, is largely through programming with museums. I mean, that's, that's how we attract audiences. And no matter you know, how we are art museums and we do present art. And so I think that for us, you know, that diversifying of our collection is the most important thing. And again, you know, I think that both Kaylee and Maria Elena talked about that a bit. Um, so we also at MIA, we work very much with, uh, with our community partners and advisors. So we've done many projects uh, around the country that you all might uh, remember. So we did a show called Hearts of Our People, which both really tried out a new model of how the museum can think about curatorial practice. And we uh, assembled a group of women uh, artists of indigenous origin, and they really were the, the curators in this entire exhibition. And we found not only that it was a huge success, very, very popular, so, but that we found that indigenous audiences also felt very welcome in, in the space and they felt very excited about the project. Uh, we have an, another uh, something else that's happening right now, which is called Rituals of Resilience that our contemporary curator did with a community partnership. And 
they actually ended up creating an album of music inspired by works by Black artists that were, are in the collection. And it's been tremendously appealing and attractive to our community. So we have lots of examples of the way that we are working it. But we also recently, we're rethinking our entire galleries right now. We're, we've just, we're just embarking on an entire reinstallation of the galleries at MIA, which are you know more, I think 175 galleries. But really to try to think about how we're telling stories differently. It will be a multi-year project uh, that will engage the entire staff uh, and all different kinds of points of view. And just one little example from that, that that is quite interesting is that we started rethinking our galleries that look at art from parts of Africa that, that have long histories of also being largely Islamic in their religious practices. So we have a small group of community members working with our curator. We have a large Somali population here in Minneapolis. And they are working with our curator to provide feedback and input on the process. And initially we expected that they would wanna spend their time explaining Islam as a part of that process to help audiences who might not be familiar with Islam and its symbolic elements. But they have been pushing the curator in the opposite direction, encouraging an embrace of the universally acceptable idea of beauty in these objects, rather than tying them more concretely to Islam per se. Uh, to me, that is a fascinating counterpoint to much of the identity politics that say that we, you know, we want to be able to recognize ourselves in our museums. It was really counter to my expectations and surprising, but it was also important from us to hear from them directly. So, I mean, that's one, those are a couple of examples of the way that we're thinking about audience and uh, the reflection um, of people in the museum, so. Thank you, Katie. Maria Elena. Um, I think that I echo um, a little bit of like, I'm still reflecting a lot with this term white supremacy because I do think in dismantling it mainly because I do think that like I think you were mentioning Karen Mary and I think you also touched on this too Kaylee like we still operate in this Eurocentric system so I really think that we have to be careful because of what is it what we want like do we want more inclusion do we want more access to economics you know what is it exactly because if we keep operating in universities and museums we're you know I don't I'm still reflecting on that that being said, I think that if we're talking about inclusion and if we're talking about economics, then that's what I would focus on, on access for more economic equity. And I think in the arts field, that's like, and in the US in general, that's like a big, um, how do you call it? Like el cuco, they say in Latin America, like the, the, the thing that haunts you, because nobody wants to talk about that. You know, people rather talk about race, but they don't realize how race and economics are tied together. <laughs> So, um, and in, like I was trying to say in the arts field, you know, we can think about what that means for salaries, access, they're all women in institutions. So I think that for me, in terms of practice, that's a way to really fight for a more equitable space and more, it's something that is gonna lead to racial justice because at the end of the day, um, I, you know, in the US, that's what I think. I also think that on an intellectual level, which I think it goes back to something that Katie was saying about um, the, the big Somalian community, um, you know, often when we talk about diversity and we have to be very careful because it's usually for a few people. And what I, that, what I mean by that is that an organization, let's say a business decides to increase diversity and they're going to increase it at 3%. But what that means is that that 3% is being fought by women, African-Americans, Caribbean Latin people, Latin American people. So, um, um, so we have to really think about how to expand that and, and really think about what diversity truly means for an organization and, and racial inclusion but also how can we create more connections in our histories? Which is why, you know, in the show that I recently did at the museum, which we're showing artists from Af uh, Afro-Latinos, Afro-Caribbeans, Afro-Europeans, Africans, African-Americans, like what are the connections within those histories? Is there a connection between the fact that after slavery was over in the US, apartheid happened in South Africa? Like, how can we start then creating those narratives and what does it mean 
for global history. Because um, I think that we, as people of color, we have to be very careful that we're constantly being pivoted against each other because the access to economic equality is so small. So, so that to me, so I wouldn't, sometimes I feel like, you know, this mental and white supremacy feels a little bit too uh, overwhelming because okay, we really destroyed our society structures that some of us, we like, like some of us like Twitter and, and this other stuff. And we like the university and we like the museums, but what, so, so I think being more precise is helpful when we talk about this thing. Thank you, Maria Elena. That was very insightful. And I also want to pivot just a bit in case uh, Kaylee wants to answer this way. You don't have to, because the answers so far have been the, the kind of structural, programmatic, right? Um, when I was thinking about my role in higher education, and I agree, I love higher education. I would like it to be more accessible. What I do personally when I have a student of color working with me, um, we work together with was an important preposition. And um, I name for them the structure so that they're not, if they, if they don't have language for that structure, they can then see that, oh, this is not their fault. This is, this is part of the harm that's been done to them as a person living in the margins, um, made to feel invisible and unwelcome. So, to help them get the language, to name it. Um, anyhow, uh, I want to leave time for Kaylee's response. Um, so I have a, I have a slightly counter uh, opinion about uh, about approaching um, this work. I think that um, that others probably in programming and education and community engagement can relate. Uh, that, uh, you know, there's approach that sort of uh, tends to, uh, you know, pick the person in that role who's off, often a BIPOC person, you know, wind them up, crank, crank the, the, the key at the back and set them outside the museum and ask to, you know, bring in. And um, I, I, I really push back against that model. Um, I, I don't think it's appropriate to bring people in to a structure that's going to cause them harm. And so I turn myself around facing the museum. And that is where my direction and my energies go, that the museum itself needs to be a place um, that, uh, that, can, um, that can support um, and, and value and appreciate um, uh, BIPOC visitors and staff. And so I think that there are um, some ways that museums can can do this better. Like if you are, if you're in the toxic workplace and it's so toxic, but you've been there for so long, you don't know that it's toxic. Um, there's a temperature check you can take. Now um, it's as easy as going on Instagram and going to change the museum. You can find out your museum's reputation amongst uh, a, a, amongst potential BIPOC candidates. I, I know this from experience. Um, there have been jobs that I've gone uh, uh, in, into interviews for where um, my black mentors have stepped up and said, you know, do not go there. Do not go to that institution. It is not going to be a safe place for you. You are going to uh, be overwhelmingly harmed day after day. Don't do it. So the reputation exists and there is a way to find out. Um, uh, Mass Action has been doing this accountability campaign, um, uh, taking the, the statements that, that came out uh, last June um, on the, the blackout uh, day and comparing that uh, to, um, to what museums uh, have actually done um, and, uh, um, and their, their, their rate of hire. I mean, it, it's so easy to go to your own HR office and learn your turnover rate. Your BIPOC turnover rate um, is probably not great um, and you can easily find that out. And I, I thought I'd also tie in a question that was asked of me in the Q&A about what am I personally doing to, um, to support uh, BIPOC peers, those who might be um, at that breaking point. Um, you know, something that I have, uh, I've always done in my practice is, uh, is to support, um, uh, to, to support uh, the, the BIPOC, often the BIPOC women, the black women, um, uh, in, in positions uh, under me or, 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 or junior positions 
in the museum is something I continue to do. Um, I continue to, to sponsor uh, my, my old intern from the month from almost four years ago now, um, helping her uh, navigate her museum career. I think that, um, that each of us that are in a position, uh, privileged enough to be in a position where we can speak up and speak out uh, w without the fear of retaliation, um, it is our responsibility to, to help others along, especially the next generation of, of practitioners. Yeah, Katie. So Karen, I, I realize that you, I didn't see your note um, before, but um, that this was, and I'm sorry that I got distracted in my previous answer, but I, you know, like, I mean, um, like what Kaylee was saying about our personal practices about how we are trying to make sure that white supremacy in the museum is uh, is something that we are undoing, that we're dismantling. Uh, we, I am, have really worked hard in this year to make sure that that is happening at MIA. And again, it's something, it's a, a learning process for me. I'm a white woman and I have, you know, I. I'm learning about uh, how to think about this and talk about this as I will say the majority of my colleagues in the director's seats are. Um, so am I, we're, none of us is perfect, but we're all really working hard, I think, to try to make the forward steps that we need to do. And we're learning from our colleagues uh, of color and we're uh, working hard to make sure that we are looking at the museum from the outside. I love that analogy, Kaylee, that you're standing outside looking back at the museum and trying to understand. So at Mia, I know that you know we've tried to do some, some um, we've tried to understand the community that exists directly around us, which is um, you know a, a predominantly not predominantly it's kind of 50-50 African American and minority community, and we we did a survey and you know, all the white people answered the survey. So that it was it was really problematic because it didn't tell us anything about what the people who we cared about reaching or thinking or, or saying. So there's, there's also about the, um, you know, my personal commitment to making this, and I saw many comments about, you know, what, what am I personally doing? And I'm, I'm raising money to make sure that the museum has the kinds of structures in place for when I'm not here anymore, because I'm trying to take the 100 year view of what the museum will need. And I'm trying to think about how we can change the museum so that we're more inclusive in terms of what kinds of art we collect and display, what kinds of curatorial voices that we have, and also what kind of uh, structure we have that will uh, enable all people to bring themselves fully and wholly to the museum and that they can uh, have full and exciting careers. I mean, I will say one of the things that I see in the museum world is that we, we tend to hire curatorial assistants or young people at entry level spots and they hope that they will have a whole career at the museum and because of this structure that is built in here, we don't often don't have that kind of mobility. Corporations are often much larger and you can climb up in the ranks. And that's one of the, the biggest problems I see is how we can ensure mobility of staff uh, in, an, in an organization. And we don't have a lot of turnover. I, I, I do a monthly all staff meeting here. And I would say half the time I am congratulating someone who's been here for 30 or 40 years. So in a staff of 200, that's, that's a lot. And so we don't simply have that much turnover now, but my goal is also to figure out a way that we can give people opportunities to grow, to learn, and it doesn't mean that necessarily they stay here for 30 or 40 years, that they get the tools that they need to have successful, joyful careers that will allow them to pursue the things that make them happy and joyful in other museums, for instance. I don't believe that people have to stay in our museum forever to be successful. Thank you. I I heard some comments that I thought were really helpful to pull together to a thread that was already started. Um, 
you know, learning from the past, right? The past mistakes and the past mistakes, I think that um, have been called out is that it was left to, I'm gonna use the term BIPOC, people of color, indigenous people to, to resolve, right? To fix those challenges or inequalities that were happening in institutions or turning to them for the answer, right? Making them the, we even have a language for this, the ambassadors of their culture, right? They had to have all the solutions. We know that's a problem. That, that, that was the model from decades ago. We know it hasn't worked. And so taking that up, right? Everybody takes up then the, the responsibility to, to create racial justice in art museums. I wonder what that looks like. And here I'm, I'm developing a question that came to us earlier. Um, the treatment of art inside and outside a museum. Uh, the person that posed the question says, is there a double standard? I'm gonna assume there's a double standard that we treat art outside of museums differently than we treat art inside. Sometimes it's not even called art. It's a, uh, a piece of plywood with paint on it, right? I'm, I'm being euphemistic, but so what is the role of a museum, an art museum in what is the role? What is the relationship between art museum and public art? Anybody? I mean, I think that in the last couple of years, there's been this whole discussion about, you know, all the Confederate monuments that are in the South and in other parts of the U.S. Not only monuments, but also names of streets. Because I think that, you know, we should not just, you know, leave it to the arts. It's really about culture here. And um, yes, there is a double standard. And there's also a double standard um, in relationship to also how art is judged by artists of color, you know? Ultimately, um, you know, we like to talk a lot about our history, but if the, our history doesn't include artists of color, then how are we assigning value? So we have to very, you know, I think the role of museums is to start re revising, including different voices and also challenging what, you know, public art is and, and what who are our monuments and also what do you do with those monuments that you removed you know I think um, for every for people that have been able to go to Germany and go to Berlin you know they actually have the Berlin Museum has all the the object of the Nazi memorabilia on display because they truly believe that you don't want to forget that you don't want to go back to that place so you don't want to forget what that symbol means and how oppressive it is so so it, there's a lot of um, um, there's a lot to discuss here, um, but yes, I, there is certainly a double standard and part of the museum's job is to revise and to be constantly revising. And that's why I do wanna go back to that idea that it's not like an end project, it's, it's a process that constantly needs to be checked and reevaluated and, and seeing how, how what's working, what's not working and what does it mean today. Um, I want to echo uh, what Maria just shared with us um, and also tie in another uh, question that was asked of us in the Q&A. So, you know, in, in my personal and professional opinion, the, the approach and the stance of art first, uh, art museum first continues to be a fatal flaw. Um, I think that, uh, I think that audiences, um, I think that the the times that we're in de demands a people first um, or an ideas first uh, approach, um, and I think that the the art first approach approach continues uh, continues to diminish and minimize um, the the work that we should be doing, and continues to put us in this position of categorizing of uh, the, the art that I'm wearing uh, today is is never going to be considered um in a museum um and you know that's not where i want to spend my time um i want to spend my time in in people and ideas and and so the question that was asked in the the q a which i think this totally relates to um uh, by brit um you know there are these two sayings uh all all are welcome here versus this place was created with you in mind 
I think that gets at the heart of the uh, of the issue of dismantling white supremacy culture in our museums. The idea that we can be this uh, white supremacist structure and operation and then say all are welcome here is hugely problematic and that's not a people first approach. That's not an ideas of first approach. It's not, it's not questioning that ideology that guides us. Now that the reverse of that, the uh, this place was created with you in mind. That is the museum I want to build. That is the museum I want to work for. That's the museum that I want to retire from. Uh, that that is that is I think the vision of of what we need to be doing. That uh, we need to be creating our spaces uh, with you in mind. That is what needs to be driving our work. Kaylee, I want to retire from that museum too. Sounds great. That's a fantastic statement that you just made. I love it. So um, I'll just, we're, we're working very hard now. There was a question about what we're doing to retain BIPOC staff. And at MIA, you know, we are looking really carefully at all of our HR functions, um, making sure that we are uh, doing everything possible both to recruit. We've been in a hiring freeze since the beginning of the pandemic last year. We've just loosened that and we're about to embark on a number of, of um, hiring job filling opportunities. And, uh, you know, we, we lost a director who went to the National Gallery and uh, took quite a few staff with her. And so we have been at a low ebb here and we've lost some other staff as well. And one of, you know, one of the things, you know, that I'm thinking about a lot is how can we make sure that we're recruiting BIPOC staff not just as at our hourly and, and entry level levels, as I said before. So we're making a really concerted effort to make sure that we have BIPOC representation throughout every part of the museum from entry level to uh, middle management to senior leadership. So I think one of the things, you know, retaining BIPOC staff is making sure that we are able to look at ourselves, understand where we are, and uh, we just we did a large uh, cultural assessment in this last six months that has been really helpful to me personally and and also has provided me with an opportunity for self reflection and to understand what me what I as a as a white bodied woman bring to this role. So again, uh, the road is long and trying to make sure that the goals that I have for the museum are fitting with the goals of what the board wants and what our community wants and how do we find that one pathway forward that that really answers everyone's uh, desires and wishes is can be very challenging. I'm doing my best. You know, we have several questions in the queue uh, from folks that are asking about board members and diversification of board members. Um, I'm going to kind of put them together, right? In addition to the racial reckoning that we've had with the murder of George Floyd and others, we've seen art museums having to respond to various scandals over the past few years. One is the striking of MoMA, right? Um, and um, sometimes there's changes in personnel or board members or acquisitions or deacquisitions. I'm wondering if it's possible for an art museum to reflect, to be self-reflective prior to change. That's one way of putting the question. Or another way of putting the question is, what does self-reflection look like at your institution or at this institution that you would like to retire from? So can we get ahead? Can institutions get ahead of this moment, these calls for change. Um, I think so. oh. <laughs> Go ahead, Kaylee. My response is really short. Um, I was just going to call back uh, once again. You know, we've we've talked about um, how this uh, this moment in time isn't new. That we are we are in a cycle. 
um, that we are on, uh, we're, we're in a certain point in a trajectory, um, that the resources exist. I'll, I'll repeat it again. The resources exist. They are out there. Um, it's time for us to start learning the lessons um, that we've been ignoring for so many years. Uh, and I'll just shout out once more, um, Mass Action, uh, museumaction.org has a free downloadable um, assessment tool that you can use uh, to, to gauge your institution's um, place on the spectrum of, of racial justice and, and, and racial equity. So I encourage institutions just to start doing the work that's already been laid out. <laughs> I think we can get ahead, um, especially when it comes to supporting um, diversity leadership on staff, and especially leadership and board. I think that if you have people in top positions that are, um, or you know, that are helping lead the conversation, that are coming into the conversation, that goes a long way. But I do want to, um, I do want to also mention that diversifying a board is difficult, especially because. Um, uh, a lot of a lot of people that can join boards, they want to believe in that the institution is truly committed, and they want to have somebody inside that they can trust. So, um, and it's something that again, even us in Miami, we 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 wrestle with. So it's not like a an easy thing to, you know, so like a magic wand that happens, um, uh, because you know it's it's a trust position and it is about support. But so I do think that. We can get ahead like if we know like we we're talking earlier about like the limits of our collections we can start investing on that so so yeah and i would say that self-reflection is something that um, is also possible so I, I mentioned before that mia is a part of the facing change cohort uh, the first facing which is sponsored by the american association of museums and there are not very many art museums that are involved in that. And it's been a very powerful, very um, interesting period of introspection for our board. And they have taken it really seriously. So I think that the opportunity for uh, boards to get engaged in that. And then, you know, for instance, one of the things that, uh, that our board decided was that every board committee would have somebody from facing change and what uh, involved in its business. So again, the idea of distributed leadership so that we're not just thinking about uh, all white board, you know, telling the white director what to do, but that uh, we, ha we have uh, uh, black board members, we have Somali board members, we have, you know, we have quite a, a growing number of, of diverse board members and that they are not just and they're also not just tasked with work doing the diversity work. They're tasked with doing the finance work and the fundraising work, and they're tasked with thinking about governance. And so to me, the, the uh, idea of diversity, I mentioned before, one of my favorite uh, expressions is the Albert Einstein one about not everything that counts can be counted. So diversity is a starting point for us. That's how we start making sure that we have voices that are there. But then the point is that how do we make sure that those voices are heard throughout? I will say that we at MIA are behind in that regard on staff. We have very, very, we have, I think only one or two members of our staff that are BIPOC that are in even middle management. The vast majority of our middle management is white. And that's something that I want to see change because again, I want to make sure that we have opportunities for all of those different kinds of perspectives to be in the conversation at every level of decision-making and leadership. I think leadership is the other thing that we haven't really talked about here. And again, I think that uh, thinking about the way that we can make opportunities for leaders across staffs is really important. And something that I'm personally really committed to. Thank you. I, I think we only have time for quick answers on a on one specific question that's come in, um, and I'm going to ask you to speak to the um, to the specifics of your institution. Um, what practices 
have BIPOC artists asked your institution to adopt in order to advance racial justice? So we talk about listening. So what have you heard? What practices have BIPOC artists asked your institution to adopt to advance racial justice? Kaylee. Um, Kaylee or Katie? I'm sorry, I thought you said me. So Kaylee, go Katie. ahead. Um, I can share. I think I think I'm allowed to share this because um, I think it was included in, in the press release. I'm pretty sure. Um, oh, hopefully, I don't get trouble for this. <laughs> um, uh, last summer, um, we uh, at SAM uh, participated um, with, I believe it was uh, ten or a dozen so uh, other museums in uh, presenting uh, Arthur Jaffa's uh, "Love Is the Message, The Message Is Death." And um, uh, we were able to present that uh, on our website so over the course of a weekend. It was in response following um, the murder of, of, of George Floyd and this uh, racial reckoning that is still ongoing today. And um, one of the, uh, this is such an interesting question um, because I'd like to see this practice happen more often. Uh, uh, one of the the requirements of showing this work um, was uh, to uh, to present um, programming um, in conjunction uh, that amplified um, the, the work of BIPOC uh, artists in our own community, um, which we were able to do in a, a variety of ways, um, a public program a panel forum on Zoom, um, uh, some some poetry and, and blog. Uh, writing as well um, and other means as well and um, I, I I feel I, I think so fondly of of that project um, because I, I think we would have um, we would have uh, enhanced the visitor experience anyways as, as we are uh, tend to do uh, but to have uh, have the artists use their power and say well to, to show my work I I want uh, the museum um, to uh, to, to use their power and their platform to support um, the, the, the BIPOC artists um, and their local community. I just thought that was so impactful and powerful. Maria, do you want me to go next or? You can go next. Okay, I don't wanna jump in ahead of you. Um, I, I would say that it, and Mia in this past year, since I've been here uh, virtually all of our programming has been related and involved with the local committee, so, community. So, um, and especially the, our communities of color, both indigenous and black and, and others um, too. So we have, you know, for this whole year, we've featured works uh, by black artists. And we've heard, you know, the, the incredible gratitude for that. We've heard that, you know, I mentioned that we have this wonderful show called Rituals of Resilience um, up right now. And uh, there was a collaborative work with, with musicians, with black musicians in the community. And they started out, they were gonna make one song. They made an, an entire album um, and it's, um, I mean, it was an exciting and wonderful process for Mia. We also worked with a, a, an artist who uh, named Lamurchi Frazier, who does fantastic tapestries. And uh, it was with the coordination of the group here in Minnesota of uh, with, uh, women of color, um, I'm gonna forget their exact name, excuse me, but they are a group of, of um, fiber artists who work and they found this artist and they brought her to us. So again, we are very much interested in what the community brings to us. And I think that's been really very important in terms of our um, outreach to that community. So we're, we're working on all different kinds of ways. And I mentioned the Hearts of Our People exhibition that we did where we uh, just in 2019, it was before I was here. So I can take no credit for that, but. Um, I think it's a good marker of the kind of things that we do at MIA. I've been thinking, so that's why I was like, oh, go ahead, Katie, because I, for my projects, I don't think I've ever been asked something that, um, I mean, I really don't think I've been asked something that has been like a, kind of like a demand that, um, 
I don't know. Like, I mean, I try to always try to buy work from the artist, you know, like I, 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 I nothing that I can recall that would, um, yeah. I mean, I know recently- so what, world, like, what world makes that possible? Like, what are you doing that makes that possible? I think communication, <laughs> communication and, and, and uh, trust and also transparency. And um, like, I don't know, when I work with artists, I always ask them, what are your expectations? You know, like, what, what is it that you need? What is it that you want? Um, because I think that once, I think that most disagreements are people that don't realize they have different expectations. So, so um, on a situation. So I think that that's, but I'm sure, I mean, I'm not gonna, like, I'm sure that something will come up and I think that contexts are different. Um, but at least in my career so far, which has been, you know, over 10 years now, I don't remember anything. I mean, I guess, the, the, yeah, anything that has been demanded that I felt like it was like this crazy, that, like, I don't know, that we're pushing the bound. Uh, this, I hope that that was useful. No, that's fine. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I want to thank everyone for joining us today, the panelists, the audience, the organizers. It is with deep gratitude that I honor the time and labor you've given to us for this event. Thank you. <laughs>